Good evening, everyone. My name is Zaha Hassan, and I'm a writer, analyst, one of your conference organizers, and a lover of great stories. I'm really pleased to have the opportunity to chat today with Isabella Hamad about her breakout book, The Parisian, which is behind me, uh, which received a lot of praise and acclaim, including winning the Palestine Book Award and the Plimpton Prize in 2019. I'll be taking your questions for Isabella via the Q&A box a little later. So please send those along as you are moved to. Um, Isabella's book, which I have right here, as I said, is available in the festival bookshop um, if you'd like to get it after this chat. Isabella, I am thrilled to be uh, chatting with you. As I said to you when we um, talked briefly yesterday, I was gifted your book by a mutual friend of ours read the first 20 pages and was just really floored by the beauty and the richness of your writing. The voice and the texture of it made me feel like you were writing from the time period of the Parisian, which is pre-World War I and just after. I think one of your reviewers compared your writing to the novel The English Patient, which is one of my favorite books of all time. So I'm, you know, I'm a lover of your, of your story. So would you start us out um, in this book chat by telling us a bit about the plot of your novel and then read uh, a small selection from your book. Yeah, first of all, thanks so much for having me. Um, and obviously, sorry, we can't be in person, but hopefully we'll meet one day. Um, so the book is, um, it's about a young man from Nablus who uh, goes to the south of France during the First World War to study and falls in love with a French woman. Um, and when he goes back to Palestine at the end of the First World War and the breakup of the Ottoman Empire, uh, he becomes known as al Barisi or the Parisian because he's kind of still infatuated with France. I and mean, it's basically about his life um, against the backdrop of the British mandate and the kind of the stirrings of the Palestinian national movement. Um, and he's based on the life of my great grandfather. So, um, so it's a real story, but um, I'm gonna read a section from uh, the second part of the book so at this point, the year is 1920, and um, the um, Emir Faisal, who uh, led the Great Arab Revolt in the Hejaz during the First World War, um, collaborating with Lawrence of Arabia, um, has announced a Syrian independent Syrian kingdom in defiance of French rule. The British and the French have carved up the Middle East, um, and the Palestinians are marching to Jerusalem to um, show their support. And they're, they're announcing that they are Southern Syrians. So they wanna be part of the Syrian kingdom. So um, Midhat is on a train with his cousin Jamil. Over the next three hours, Midhat fell into a daydream. He thought of what Hani had said in his letter about naming themselves Syrians and wondered what might happen next. Perhaps a war of independence, which would do what to Nablus? He already knew how wartime could suspend the normal rules. It might free him from his father's command. Syria would be free, and so would Midhat. Jamil met his eye and winked. The mountains beyond the window interrupted the sunlight, sculpting his cousin's cheekbones with their moving shade. Beyond him, the foreign women hunched on the benches. And where would that freedom lead? Teta was right, he did not know what he wanted. His tableau vivant of King Faisal ruling Palestine lapsed into a vision of himself in Cairo, married with small children. He tried to work out where this image had come from and was bewildered to realize that he was imagining himself married to Layla. The echo of a drum fought discordantly with the rhythm of the crankshaft. In English, a woman cried, there are so many people. The window was filled with heads and flags. The roar reached them dimly, like a waterfall across a canyon. Midhat put an arm across Jamil to let the women alight first. Several thanked him, and as he bowed and lifted his tarbouche, Jamil hit him on the chest with the back of his hand and laughed. Stepping down was like stepping into a thundercloud. Michael, isn't that the Hebron procession? shouted an Englishman in a boater. I thought they weren't coming for an hour yet. They followed the crowd towards the old city. One smug looking tarbouche was carrying a gramophone above his head, but its music was inaudible. The crowd thickened and slowed, 
and a horse appeared by the roadside wearing a stout, bearing a stout man with a small block of a moustache. Ya comrades, his chins distended. Behave peacefully, ya comrades. At Jaffa Gate, they came to a stop behind a group of young European men refusing to go further. Vithat took Jamil by the arm. We're going in? Of course, he shouted. And plunging through the group, he released Jamil's arm to clap, borne along under the arch of the gate. The Europeans had moved to one side, and as the parade bent to fit through the entrance, Midhat saw that its tail was made up of Arab women. Many carried banners and placards like the men. A few even waved Sharifian flags. They were shouting something. Falastin Aradna was the first phrase. He could not make out the second. All at once, the crush overtook them, and as they were impelled under the vault into the open air on the other side, stay with me, said Midhat, snatching his cousin's sleeve. They saw more women on the balconies above, throwing coloured handkerchiefs down onto their heads. By a group of drummers, a Sufi dervish in a long gown and jacket of balding velveteen began to dance. His body talked, first one way and then the other, so his garments spun out and the seams twisted. He rocked his head back and forth, patting the ground with his feet. Dust rose in a mist. The crush became an audience, dilating the space around him. A clap started, then one song caught over the discordance of the many and spread around their area. And as someone pushed him closer to the dervish, Mithat lost his hold on Jamil. The dancer's feet passed faster, faster, and Mithat stepped close enough to hear the man's own voice. La ilaha illallah, la ilaha illallah. Then something unexpected happened. Half propped up by people on either side, Mithat experienced a strange dull explosion in his chest something close to joy, but deeper and more serene. He moved his head to the pulse, his tongue ticked against his hard palate. Unable to see the dervish's feet, Mithat watched him revolving with mechanical smoothness, motored by the turbines of his tensed, upstretched wrists. A hand clasped his neck. Is everything all right? Jamil's hair was matted, his forehead shining, a scum filmed his upper lip. Look, look, Dubke. The dervish gave way to a line of village men grasping elbows and hopping up and down. One at a time they shuffled to the centre of the vacated ring and jumped and kicked from somewhere pipes. Mithat looked down at his own legs. His shoes were pale with dust. He felt a shove from behind. You know Dubke. No, I don't. He gasped a laugh and pushed back. The group of women at the rear had moved under the arch and as the crowd compacted, they settled by the wall and clapped along. One woman near the front, who was not clapping, caught Midhat's attention. She was looking directly at him, staring, in fact, and standing very still. He tried to keep her level in his sight while everyone else jostled, then knew she had detected him because she quickly turned away. She remained in absolute profile, motionless. Without even thinking of Jamil, Midhat pushed towards her. Although she did not move her head, he could see the white corner of her eye go black with her turning iris. Without the other eye, the single organ was like an object, and he did not have the feeling of meeting someone's gaze. Instead, he was looking, watching her looking at him. A body blocked his view. He pressed against the next person along to take the woman into his sight again, provoking a knock on his shoulder as the dancing circle closed in on itself. The crowd began to shift. The horde of waiting pilgrims by the gate plunged towards him, and then she turned. He caught her, Fat Muhammad, both eyes, the downward slope at the corners, and though he could not see the rest of her face, the eyes were enough to summon the whole. Beautiful. So you said that this novel is based on the life of your great grandfather, Matet. Clearly you had to do an amazing amount of research for this novel. You didn't have access to your great grandfather, so I'm sure you had to take some artistic liberties here and there to bring him to life. Can you talk about that whole process um, you used to write the novel from the book research to your grandmother's um, role in all of that? And what does it take to get this level of authenticity in a work of historical fiction? Um, how much did you feel constrained by the truth? <laughs> okay. Um, well, first of all, I had a very strong sense of his character because he was very beloved in the family and he partly raised my father. So I kind of grew up with these stories about him, about him being uh, mainly about him as an older man, being a kind of 
gentle, um, slightly silly character who still had this sort of performative Frenchness. Um, and I, and he, caught my, he caught my imagination uh, from a young age. So in a way, my book is, is sort of, um, you know, the answer to the question, how did he become that man? You know, I, I didn't really have many stories about him as a younger man, except for the famous story of the French woman um, and, the, and the intercepted letter. That's the kind of, that was the sort of main story of his youth. But apart from that, it was always the kind of the later life. So a lot of it was conjecture because I only really have photographs and, and didn't have any um, remaining documentation. And the other thing is that the oral testimonies that I got about him from elderly family members and people who knew him in Nablus all conflicted with one another. So it's very difficult to actually find out the truth, um, which in a way I think was probably quite liberating because I felt like I could, uh, if other people could invent, then I could invent, you know, so I could sort of, I could pick and choose, you know, what, which version of events I wanted. Um, but um, my grandmother was the main source of, principal source of, uh, of stories about him. Um, and then I, I did, I kind of cast a wider net to get general stories about Nablus in this period. I mean, the writing of this book was, was, you know, clearly a personal journey for you beyond the mapping of the internal and external um, journey of Medhet that he was taking in the novel. You're a bicultural writer, partly British Irish, partly Palestinian. How did the process of writing the book impact you and your sense of Palestinian identity? Um, it definitely, I mean, you know, I started, I wanted to write the book from when I was a teenager. So it kind of been baking in me for many years. And I definitely think that the, of course, the process of researching it and writing, it was an enormous learning experience of growing, you know, if you grow up in the diaspora and we didn't go to Palestine as children. Um, so I went when I left university for the first time. So I was kind of approaching, but it was, those are important years as well as you're kind of on the cusp of adulthood. Um, so it was very much a personal journey, of course, of coming to understand my own family um, and what they've been through and to understand also the late, by understanding Midhat, I was also understanding the later generations. So it was a kind of, it was very expansive as an experience for me. And, and I feel like the book is one small portion of that in a way. We have a question um, from the audience uh, the following up on that, asking about, um, uh, the relationship between the Samaritans and the British in the novel and out, you know, beyond <laughs> the novel. Can you speak to that a little bit, the Samaritans of Nablus? Um, I don't know about the Samaritans' relations with the British um, per, per se. I don't know if maybe that audience is referring to um, uh, the kind of um, the fetishization of the Samaritans that did occur. There was like a, there was a man, I became kind of very interested in a guy called Moses Gaster, who was a Romanian uh, folklorist who became um, infatuated with the Samaritans. And it was actually in his house in London that the Balfour Declaration was signed. But he had a kind of, he was, um, he was a Jewish exile who did kind of a lot of research about the Samaritans. And there was a series of events, which I kind of traced through, um, I think his archives are in uh, at Oxford, actually. But there were a series of events I traced through newspaper articles where some a Samaritan high priest came to London to sell uh, some artifacts. And I think, I can't remember if this is one of the problems with me is that like I do this research and then I kind of invent. So I'm not really quite sure what's real and what I invented, but I think <laughs> they were fake documents. So this was a sort of, they kind of, they, they fabricated some of these documents basically because they need money, they're running out of money. Um, so they were taking advantage of this fetishizing that was happening. And I found that very provocative because a lot of the book is about um, the gaze, whether that's the kind of orientalizing gaze or, uh, you know, the gaze of a lover, or what does it mean to look upon an other um, and how that interacts with power, particularly in a colonial context. But I liked this, this example of the Samaritans who are the object of an orientalizing gaze, manipulating that, kind of playing with it. Um, and I felt a little bit like there was some kinship there with Midhat, who is looked upon as an other, and then he kind of plays with it. Um, I don't know if that really answers the question, but that's, I guess, what comes to mind. Yeah. So um, that that first visit that you took to Palestine for the for the research with your grandmother, that was a first journey for you to mm -hmm. the country. And mm -hmm. talk about what that was like, and 
And um, to what extent did, did that come into the story of your book, that whole idea of going to a place that you, you know, only have in your imagination and then making it real, um, similar to, to Med Hat going into, going to Europe. And, um, you know, this was a place that of a fantasy for folks living in Palestine, the, you know, traveling to Europe and he, he made this, this journey and, and how he tried to fit in. Um, what was it like for you having heard all these stories about Palestine growing up? You know, it's very, um, you know, it's um, very stylized in terms of the way our family talks about it to, you know, their, their children in the diaspora. So how, what was it like for you to finally go there and to be there with your grandmother, who was this repository of memories um, for you of, of your, you know, Palestinian identity? Um, and then just, you know, just the practical ways, like, did you have any trouble getting in? Was there any, um, you know, any kind of uh, issues with you doing the research in the country that you wanted to do? Um, I mean, it was, at the beginning, it was really overwhelming. I mean, that's uh, not to talk about kind of border crossing experience, which I can come to in a second, but it was, because it was so much family, I mean, like being in Nablus, it was like a constant stream of introductions, as you can imagine. And um, I had can't, I, and I wanted to, inter I didn't really know what I was doing. I wanted to write in some way. Um, my gr grandmother, bless her, Sort of had a lineup of people from a variety of different families in Nablus to me to interview. She told people I was doing a history of Nablus, so I kind of had to pretend I was doing a history of Nablus, but I didn't meet a lot of people and kind of, you know, there was a lot of sort of entertaining and socializing, um, which was a little kind of uh, that. So that was my kind of initial experience of Nablus was just sort of being around people all the time. Um, and uh, and then I spent I spent time in Ramallah and uh, and traveled around sort of talking to people, talking to historians, uh, visiting people in. Uh, people's grandparents and just gathering stories in a slightly um, in a slightly haphazard way to be honest at the beginning I didn't I think I was just trying to I was also encountering with the modern day reality for the first time at the same time that I had this plan to sort of go back in time um, I was you know it was very much mediated by the current reality um, which of course inflects the interviews, because it's very hard to, first of all, there aren't that many people who still uh, remember um, the time before the Nakba. And then, and then what people do remember um, can be very general. You know, it can be a little bit difficult to get to the particulars of memory. Um, and were you speaking to them in Arabic or was that also mediated? Uh, it was a mixture. It was a mixture. Um, it depended on my comfort level um, and... Um, um, some, some of them I recorded, some of them I didn't. It was all quite like haphazard. Um, but um, um, yeah, and then, I, and then I met a historian, an Armenian historian, which was sort of a breakthrough moment. He decided to adopt me. And then I, and then I found everything. I, I think it gave me a bit of confidence and I, and I that started to find a bit, bit easier and had a bit more confidence in, in the project as a novel. Um, but yeah, it was a it was a it was a life changing year. It was a life changing year, definitely. Was it was the story that you told the story that you thought you were going to tell? You know, a lot of times we yeah. have you, you might have the whole thing plotted out, like what you want to say, and then through the research, it takes you in a whole other different direction. Did it come out the way you thought it was going to come out, or did you really, um, you know, develop your your great grandfather's character and story as you went along? I think both are true. I think that I had a sense of the architecture of it. Um, like I wanted it to play with time in a very particular way. Like I wanted to write a long novel so that when the reader gets to the end, they experience the distance from the beginning that the character feels and that time and distance are sort of mixed together, which I feel is very important for us so understanding, I don't know, you know, Palestine is not only a place, also kind of a time, you know, there's sort of time and place are sort of mixed in this way. Um, and uh, so I had that in mind. And I actually, at the end of that first year, I did a draft of the final chapter, uh, which had a completely different ending, but it did have a sort of similar mood and it was set in the 1930s in Nablus. So I, I think I had a vague sense of where I was going, but I think it's boring if you kind of know exactly what's gonna happen. I feel like it, there needs to be a process of discovery and it's also a process of self-discovery. And it's also about understanding 
history, as I learned more and more about the history, you know, I couldn't resist um, including things and everything sort of seemed to feed into each other and new questions would arise. And as I answered them, other puzzles would unravel. So it was, a, it was also a kind of exploration, definitely. We have a question um, and I'm, I'll read it. Um, it says, I re and we're getting a lot of this actually in the chat to you. I really appreciated the novel, which I found unsettling in a good way. I wondered if you could speak to your choice to include Arabic speech and transliteration in the novel. As an Arabic speaker living in the US, the English Arabic mix reminded me of speaking <clears throat> to diasporic Arab and Palestinian friends. So it felt intimate to me. Um, yeah, so, so there are kind of two answers to that question. One is, um, it definitely is a kind of Arabizi sort of like mix. You know, the <laughs> words that I would that I would Arabize were ones that maybe would be naturally um, in Arabic in in that kind of like diasporic way of mixing the languages. Um, but on the other hand, the novel is very much about the protagonist's um, split sense of self. Well, he has these two experiences in two different languages, and he kind of can't translate himself between the two. So it seemed important to me to have some texture of the languages. I never really like, I didn't, I didn't put things in Arabic or in French that like, you know, you needed to know, um, or, you, you know, that required translation broadly. Um, but I felt that it needed some of that. You needed to have a sense that they were speaking a particular language in order for that to come across. Um, but I know it can alienate a reader who doesn't have those languages, although I wonder if that really matters. Maybe it doesn't mm -hmm. matter. So, you know, obviously your book is centered around Palestine and a Palestinian protagonist, um, but the story could have been set anywhere, really. Um, it's about trying to find your place, your identity, trying to be true to your roots and home, while also having a deep appreciation and love of something else or some other place. But there's a sense of guilt about it or shame almost from um, Midhat about this. Is that something that you think um, Palestinians living in the, in the diaspora feel too about having one foot in one country, but maybe their heart somewhere else or vice versa. Um, is that is that something that you try to bring out, um, you know, consciously, or is that something that kind of developed um, through the story? Um, was that conscious? I think it's something I observe definitely. Um, I think especially for a generation who were not living in the West, in diaspora, were not uh, comfortable to assert their Palestinian identity for a number of reasons, um, and therefore wanted to assimilate. And, that, and the, what that produces, the condition that produces psychologically, I think is apparent to me and interests me. Um, I also think that, I, I'm, yeah, maybe that's why I was interested in having a, a kind of anti-hero or someone who's not really uh, who's kind of insufficiently committed in a certain way, but who exists in a milieu where there are lots of people who are very active in the struggle, which allows me, you know, as a writer to then like, you know, portray, portray it through their experience. Um, but to have a, you know, a character who's the Parisian, not the Palestinian, you know, who, um, who's imperfect. What, is, what does it mean to be a lover in a time of war? I think that dilemma, I think, uh, I think was just, you know, interesting to me, definitely. Now, for those uh, listening in that are, are writers or budding writers, um, I wanted to get into some of the technical stuff too. I mean, I think getting the right narrative voice is sort of the hardest thing to nail in fiction, particularly in a first, um, first novel. Um, could you talk about how you develop that, um, how you hone that, um, that particular skill in writing? Because I, I think you can learn a lot through um, classes and you know workshops and what have you, but I feel like that's one of the hardest things. So tell us how you you get your voice in your work or find your um, voice for the work. Uh, I guess read a lot of books. Um, read <laughs> books. I think let me try and answer this in a satisfying way. I think that. Um, I think that once I got to, I worked through it basically chronologically, apart from that kind of like a bunk final chapter that I scrapped. And that once I got to part two, I feel, I think I kind of got it. I like sort of suddenly knew what I was doing. And I went back to the beginning 
And with this knowledge of what I was doing, having been fumbling in the dark a bit, I went back to the beginning and pushed through. I, I spent a kind of three weeks where I worked. It was the my best working experience I've ever had, where I like, would wake up incredibly early. I mean, not 4 a.m. So I had just told me she wakes up at 4 a.m. But, um, <laughs> but, um, but I would, um, I, I, and I kind of pushed through with this sort of quite solid sense of, um, uh, of what the story was doing. I feel like any, anytime anyone talks about writing, it sounds kind of inchoate, and I think it's a little difficult to make it sound logical, but that was my experience of it. And I think the breakthrough I'd had was, you know, stories can be infinite and they can multiply, especially if you're doing a story with a lot of characters that have a lot of backstories, you can find yourself digressing enormously. When I got to part two, I, I sort of realized my limiting factor was Nablus and that any story the rule I made was that any story that couldn't, in theory, have reached Nablus via hearsay was not included. Obviously, you break the rules a little bit here and there and you stretch the corners of these things. <laughs> but with that, I pushed through and it kind of gave me an authoritative voice, which is a kind of secret we or a secret hearsay of Nablus, which is never mentioned. But it, it somehow grounded the narrative, I think. Um, that and reading a lot of books, I think, are the two ways I found it. So is it hard to be male in, <laughs> in you know, because <laughs> you had to, you know, you're writing about your great grandfather, you know, people always say, write what you know, right? <laughs> um, so when you're writing, <laughs> when you're writing um, in the masculine too, I mean, I think that was, that must have been challenging too, because you're really not writing about, this book is totally not writing about what you know, in terms of, you know, the protagonist, in terms of the time period. Um, and the fact that you hadn't been to Palestine before, you know, you even, you know, you hadn't lived in Palestine before. So, I mean, you really gave yourself serious challenges. Um, <laughs> so I don't know how you, how you um, managed all of that. If there, if you have some advice for folks on, on that. Um, I think challenge is good. I think that there's no point if it's not challenging, uh, but it was a challenge. Like it, I wouldn't, I won't deny it. Like it was very hard. And, it, and there were a lot of times where I just felt like, you know, part of it was I had the, I had the, the sort of outline of his life. So I sort of roughly knew what happened. And then, and then I felt like I was trying to uncover psychologically why he would have done these things. Why did he make these decisions? You know, what was the process that led to that? So there was a lot of actually logical trying to work it out and thinking about it and thinking about people I know or in the world or, you know, talking about it with friends or, so there was a sort of um, a practical element of it. Um, and at the same time, you do have to sort of leave yourself behind. I do think that when you're uh, writing, you do kind of leave the, you leave yourself and that's part of what's very liberating about it, um, but, but very challenging. I didn't make it easy for myself. But I think a part of it, I didn't know how difficult it was going to be. So I had the kind of uh, had the bliss of ignorance of being young and kind of thinking, oh, I'll do this in a year. It will be easy. You know? Was it was there any part of you that was like worried about your family like that you self-censored in a way because you this isn't about just some fictitious yeah. <laughs> characters that came out of nowhere, their their family. Um, so mm -hmm. did that hinder you in, in a way? Um, I know it can be helpful because you obviously have access just to people that you can kind of pull from but um and I, you know this is this story's you know because it he's no longer with us Alayyad Hama your great grandfather <laughs> um there isn't that concern that like okay this you know I'm going to alienate a living family member but you know there was there any part of you that was concerned about you know making not not um um just harming the the you know legacy of your family member sure um i mean he was so beloved that it wasn't like there was kind of some dirt to dig up or kind of write about him but I, I i um i think that i didn't really censor myself and that's partly because when i started writing it i had no idea that it would even be published you know i didn't really have a sense of it being a published book you know i kind of it was just this thing i was doing um, and I think that a lot of it was led by curiosity and curiosity can be quite transgressive and want to know everything. So I, I didn't really self-censor, um, self-censor rather. Um, but yeah, I don't, uh, you know, thankfully I don't think there was anything really to be worried about. I would say that when there were members of the family who didn't get very good press from their descendants, I generally was 
like in fiction, I think that a bad a kind of a, a mean character or an unsympathetic character just means there hasn't been enough time spent on them. You should be able to make any character sympathetic. So um, even those family members who were not, you know, didn't weren't remembered really greatly, I actually devoted quite a lot of time to sort of unpicking them. Um, and um, I guess the other thing I'll say is that I did make up quite a lot of stuff. So it's not like it kind of kept, you know, minutely to the historical record. So I have been quite clear that it is fictional, um, which has got me out of a few, um, uh, you know, struggles with distant family members who've quibbled with my family tree, for example, which I've obviously adjusted <laughs> to trim. To I really me. appreciated the family tree. <laughs> <laughs> I need a roadmap, even even of my own family. It's like I have to I have to draw it out just to remember my cousins. So uh, that thanks for doing that in the book. <laughs> we have a few questions, so let me try to um, get folks in. And and for those who are raising their hand, um, please write your you know drop your questions in the Q and A because uh, we don't really have the ability to start taking questions. Um, live from you but we'll take them if you drop them in the q a uh, let me see so we got here from stan <laughs> stan wants to know that you know he's lived in nablus for a couple of years do you have any favorite cafes that you write in <laughs> in nablus i assume um there's that one in the hotel i like what's it called is it the asanina hotel that one's quite nice yeah did you visit the soap making factories? <laughs> yeah, yeah, of course. Many of them, yeah. It's, it a, it's, one a, that, yeah so. it's a must, right? Um, <laughs> everyone's really interested in your, your research as I was reading this book because of just like how textured it is with all of these layers of research from your time and, you know, the, the, the scenes in France, the scenes in uh, Nablus. Um, Sam, Sammy Halaby wants to know, how did you get all the geography in France and all the technical medical info? <laughs> Describe the amount of research you did, like how much of your time did that take? Um, I did spend some time looking at the, I mean, I was a bit obsessive actually, and I don't think I needed to be, but I did look at like the, um, the curricula of, in the Montpellier medical school in that period and fished some things from there. And I spent quite a lot of time on Google Maps of Montpellier and looking at kind of working out routes and things. Um, so, yeah, I was a little nerdy about those things. I, I, I mean, what it. did what did writers do before <laughs> the internet? This is this is what I want to know. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> now um, this is not so easy, or, or you know, Palestine's not so easy to do such a thing. Although there are some great maps now and some great projects after the book now, but um, with mapping. As uh, Zainab is asking, while reading the novel she had the impression that Nablus is dominant, almost a character as important in the narrative as Medhet. Um, was that a conscious decision that to give uh, Nablus life? Yes, yes, it was. I don't know if I can say much more about that, but yeah, definitely. I mean, it was like, as I was saying earlier, kind of like, um, I wanted to sort of give it, give it a kind of consciousness that would allow the kind of limit where the stories went so that everything was filtered through hearsay so the novel was at once very written and also based on this unspoken orality so um, kind of gossip in Nablus is sort of my the, the gossip of elders yeah. <laughs> um, and then Omar Shanti says reading the book in the end with its intricate structure and narrative it's difficult to imagine it once involved fumbling in the dark and this is a quote do you have any thoughts um, on for how much you should structure plan before you write how much of an idea of plot and characters do you like to have before picking up a pen, if any? Um, I think it really depends on the writer, because some people, um, you know, I know writers who, you know, plot everything intricately. They can't begin until they know exactly uh, what they're going to do and they know exactly the character arcs and they have millions of sticky notes everywhere. And I'm not one of those writers <laughs> because I like to have, I like to be discovering, you know, and for there to be some unknowns. Um, but I think it's good to have a, some vague sense of where you're going, uh, even if it's, you know, uh, pretty ambiguous or it's just a feeling or it's something that you, you're, you're aiming towards. Um, but sometimes you discover things in the process of writing. You know, the process of writing is also generative. It's not simply, I don't believe it's simply you have something in your head you put on the page. I think there's a much more of a feedback mechanism that happens. So you have to kind of be alive to that as well. 
but planning is good. I mean, I would, I would, you know, do character, do um, chapter breakdowns and all that stuff as well. So. Okay. It's good to, it's good to know your process. I mean, Andrew Ross is asking, um, he says the prison is a difficult act to follow. And I agree. It's an amazing, um, amazing novel and just how much you put into it. Any words to share about the next project? What do you, do you have a next project that you're working on right now? <laughs> I'm in the penultimate chapter, so it's the end is in sight, light at the end of the tunnel. Um, <laughs> I've been working on it for a few years, um, and I don't have a title yet, sadly. I have a few titles that aren't working. Um, but how it's how about, long did, did the Parisian take you first, so we know? It took five years in total with the edits. Wow. Yeah. Um, and this one is set in the summer of 2017, and it's about three women. Um, yeah. So, okay. What what time period did you say? It's the summer of 2017. Um, okay. Yeah. Much more accessible to you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's in Palestine again, you know, but I was there in the summer of 2017. So I'm also trying to wrap my own memory of what the things that were happening then, but yeah. yeah. I want to talk to you a little bit about sort of getting, you know, breaking into this this literary world as a Palestinian writer. How hard is it? And related to that, do you do you want to be known as a Palestinian writer first, or would you rather be thought of just as an amazingly talented writer who happens to be Palestinian? Mm -hmm. I know that's not a fair question when you are when you, you're having this book talk at Palestine Writes Festival. But do you um, do you think about that at all? So to your first question, well, my, my way in which I got published was slightly random. I mean, you know, I, um, I, um, well, not random, but it was particular. I, in order to keep going with the book, I'd been writing it for a year. I went to graduate school in the States, for the funding basically. And one of my teachers sent the book to her agent, which sort of kick-started the process. So in that way, it was kind of facilitated for me. But I think that in order for that to have happened in the first place, there needed to be some kind of change that happened in the environment that would allow such a thing to happen, because I think that would have been much harder a few years ago. That said, there were, were in, that was in the UK. Then in the US, there was, without going into too much detail, there was, a, it felt more hostile as an environment. And, um, Although I uh, am very lucky with my publisher, they're incredibly supportive. Um, there was, I did have the feeling from some publishers that, that, that it was inflammatory. There was even kind of, I remember one letter using the word, talking about f lighting fires, which is actually quite interesting because it's like a, it is a book set, you know, it's before the Nakba, there's no, no Israel, you know. There's hardly any Jewish. There's the word Palestinian in there. <laughs> because that exactly is inflammatory. So that was, I mean, that was interesting. But I, but I mean, I, I do think that um, there, there is a, there is a, a bit of a sea change that has started to happen, and so that's been facilitated something for my generation, I would say, in the publishing world. It feels like it. There's just a lot more writing Palestinian writers out there. So on the, on the other question. Do you want to be known as a writer who happens to be Palestinian or just you want you like being known as a Palestinian writer? I mean, I feel like I don't know that there needs to be such a hard line between the two. I think there's always a danger of ghettoizing writers or having like a section of the bookshop that's, you know, dedicated to a region or kind of as if it's a genre. Um, mm -hmm. I think that's problematic. At the same time, I think it's um, productive to see yourself as part of a tradition or multiple traditions. And I also think that um, I don't see myself only ever writing about Palestine, but I think that being Palestinian can give you particular kinds of perspectives on other kinds of stories um, from around the world, from imaginary places. So I don't think that I, I don't think that either bothers me. I don't have a preference. I think I, um, I think identity is a, man, a multifaceted thing. Um, um, but when it comes to, I don't know, um, labeling or descriptions in the publishing world, yeah, there are problems with ghettoizing, but then there's also some, perhaps, some pride, you know, I think that, um, so I think that I think both, is fine, both are fine by me, yeah. Good. From Reem Farah, uh, what has it been like to write about Palestine and receive acclaim in the literary world? Do you have stories of colleagues in the literary world being supportive or not so? 
Um, colleagues are really being supportive. Um, like I say, I think my my I feel well supported by my editors, and that's the most important thing to me. So um, I think that um, I feel very lucky in that respect that that the kind of the people I work with are very supportive. I think that also when you're because I'm even though there were there were responses from editors who didn't want to publish it, seemingly on the grounds they thought it was inflammatory. Um, because it's set before 1948, that's a little bit of a cover, I think, to some degree. Um, it, uh, even though it's, um, you know, uh, it wasn't intentional though. That was because you're you wanted to write the story of your great grandfather, right? They, well, but it was intentional actually. It was what? also it was a, it was motivated. And like I did it, the last time I crossed the border. Um, obviously I had a copy of the book that I brought to give to somebody and idiotically I always do this I gave it to my friend to put in her bag and then obviously I opened her bag and looking at them looking at the map it was quite a sight looking at you know the front of the book there's a map um and uh and they really you know they went to town over it um but also obviously there is it's uh it's threatening in a way to to, to be saying that um it was not a land without a people um but that's becoming harder and harder to say in public. You know, it's, it's harder and harder to claim as they used to. Oh, they just they're just some peasants who came over from Jordan. Um, but because it's not about it's pre the, the establishment of the state of Israel, I think that that um, is uh, saves me in some way. I don't know what's going to happen with the next one, but we'll see. Has any of this, you know, um, debate around what is anti-Semitism and the the effort to to make it more and more difficult to assert a Palestinian identity or a narrative, does that impact your work at all and, and um, your speaking about your work uh, in various places? How does that impact you? I mean, obviously it produces anxiety as I think it does for everybody. Um, you feel like you have to tread very carefully. Um, I think that uh, in the process of writing, I think that I don't self-censor, self but um, I imagine in editing, I'm going to be watching with a careful eye because it's so easy to misconstrue things. But I think that you feel that generally, um, I would say when you're writing as an Arab about Arabs, that you're in the process of writing, you don't want to write with the Western gaze in mind. You kind of just want to write your thing. But I think you're ultimately, when you're publishing in English, you're actually interacting with stereotypes from the get go. And that's something you can't escape. Um, so you do have to bear that in mind, you know, um, you have to be careful that you're not going to fall into traps um, that are kind of ready made for you. Um, so, so yeah, I think that there is naturally some censorship that goes on because it's a difficult environment to be, to be yeah. um, narrating such stories. Sunaina is asked, or first she wants to say to you, the novel is so brilliant, moving, and profound. <laughs> um, she says, I particularly appreciate the reflection, the reflections on women's activism in Palestine during that period. As I was reading about the car caravans with women, similar caravans were happening at protests here in California during COVID. Also mm -hmm. appreciate the discussion of boycotts. So that's from Sunain. I just wanted to share that with you. And um, from Eyewitness Palestine, which Palestinian writers, storytellers do you like to read? Um, well, they're the usual suspects like Kenafani, and um, I read twice before I started writing this, so I'm not sure that he has much of an, I don't know, maybe there is the evidence of it, but I loved Arabesques by Anton Shamas, um, which I read before writing it. I mean, obviously it's a lot about the 30s, so um, probably that did kind of go into my subconscious in quite a strong way. Um, but there are so many. I mean, um, all the poets, um, many of the attendees of this festival. Um, I love um, Adenia Shibli, um, which I think her work is tremendous. Yeah, there are countless great, great, great storytellers and poets. Your um, Irish ancestry is as steeped in storytelling and the art of resistance as your Palestinian ancestry. Is, is there a possibility that you might um, have a project that kind of brings those two worlds together <laughs> in a story. Oh my God. <laughs> and did you did you experience any family members from your Irish side saying, "Hey, what about us? Like, why didn't you write about our story?" 
Um, I don't know about that, but I mean, I am interested in, um, I, I, you know, I'm finishing this book, but I have a, another book that I'm plotting, which I am, well, I mean, obviously it's, it's like hardly even a, you know, um, hardly germinating, but I am interested in writing about um, kind of Bandung era uh, nationalisms and where Palestine fits into that. So thinking about, um, which is obviously, you know, inflected by current um, solidarity movements and thinking about kind of transcultural solidarity from different repressed groups. Um, uh, but thinking about that in the mid century, particularly mid 20th century. So, so bro certainly broadening outside of Palestine, I'm, I'm interested in doing, although I, I haven't specifically thought about the Irish, but I guess that would be relevant. <laughs> Um, Ella, I believe, uh, if I'm saying it right, because there's so many different kinds of Ella's <laughs> in Arabic, um, is saying photography and scenes of being photographed are important in the novel. Could you please speak to that? Um, I guess that comes back to, you know, the thing about the gaze and being looked at and looking upon. Um, I also, that might well be because a lot of my research involved looking at photographs and there were a lot of photographs taken in that period and that's one of the richest ways I think to enter into the time period and there are big collections of photographs in different places within um, historic Palestine and outside as well. Um, but um, yeah, I mean there's the photograph in the party, the women's party that was, there's this book by um, a, French, um, a French priest called Antonin um, Josson, who, who wrote a book about Nablus, who I based the French uh, priest character on. But at the back of his book, um, which is called Nablus et son district, um, there are photographs of women at a party. Um, and that was kind of where that scene came from. Although I tried to work out who had taken the photographs, I found it hard to believe that the French priest himself attended the women's party in Nablus and took these photographs <laughs> of the ladies dressed in their party, party dresses. But anyway, but there are these um, extraordinary photographs of where they're really elaborately dressed and it was in the, in the 20s. And... Hmm. Um, Helen wants to know, has it been translated into Arabic or will it be? And what response would you anticipate for your work from an Arabic reading audience? It has been translated. It was meant to come out this summer, but with COVID it's been postponed. So it should be out next year. Um, I don't know. I don't know what to expect. Um, I, obviously a lot of people in the Arab world have read it in English or have been reading it in English, but uh, of course it will read a wider, a wider audience, including hopefully my grandmother. I'm hoping that someone will read it to her. She can't, she's going blind, but, um, but yeah, I'm looking forward to it. I don't know what to expect. Speaking of your grandmother, what did she think about the, the novel? Well, she's delighted. She hasn't read it all. I think she's read some bits, um, but um, I think when the Arabic comes, she'll, she'll have better access to it. But in general, she's very pleased. So, yeah. Yeah, I'm sure I think she she's felt... responsible for it, which is fine. Yes. I mean, yeah. she's, a, she's, yeah. she's invested in it because she, yeah, yeah. She, was your, she was your ticket into, into the whole world, right? So. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's great. I'm sure that was sort of a, a a nice way to build connection to with your grandmother. Yeah, very much. Beyond very your great-grandfather, but your grandmother. Um, yeah, yeah. Okay. So that's cool. Well, we are um, close to out of time, but I did want to, again, encourage people to go to the bookstore. You can find, I think, most of the authors that we're having book chats with, including Isabella's um, book there at the bookstore. It's right behind me, as I said earlier. And um, I also want to let folks know, Isabella, are you going to go to the Afterward Lounge <laughs> and I hang out? I can, if I can try and find it, yeah. Well, I will. Yeah, I'll you can it. find it if you go. Um, so folks, there's this Afterwards Lounge where you can go and continue chatting about the novel and, and other topics. And Isabella might hang out there for a few minutes. So <laughs> you could possibly interact with her if she can find it. <laughs> You can find the Afterwards Lounge by, you know, if you can't see it from, you know, just the lobby, you can ask um, the reception, the information desk for, about how to get to it. Um, and then don't forget um, to also sign the graffiti wall. Isabella, you do this too. Find the graffiti wall 
for the conference and you can write a message, uh, whatever you want. It could be a poem, could be just your appreciation, whatever it is, but the icon for it is Hanthala. So if you see a Hanthala icon, that's, you click on that, you can sign the wall. Um, and uh, like I said, if you have any trouble finding these things, you can always ask the information desk. Um, also 5.30, um, Samia Halabi and Faisal Saleh will be talking about narrating Kufur Qasim. So join that too. Thanks a lot, Isabella Hamad. It was a real pleasure to, to meet you after reading your amazing book. Likewise. Thanks everybody. And thank you, Zaha. Yeah, take care. Bye. Ciao. Bye.